Welcome back everyone. Uh, I'd like to now introduce Greg Dark from Google here in Sydney, uh, here to talk about App Engine and generators as coroutines. Right. Uh, good morning everyone, I think it still is. Yep. So, just quickly get through with the introduction, so you know who I am, I'm Greg Dark. Uh, I'm a software engineer, I work on the App Engine team in Sydney. Uh, in particular, I work on TaskQ, uh, Cron, and the BookUse API. Um, that's my main project. I also like to work on just general parts of the Python SDK, the admin console, and I've done a bit of work on the new Python 2.7 runtime that we've announced on the Python mailing list. Quick thing about what App Engine is. Uh, App Engine is a platform that allows developers, so everyone in this room, uh, to run their web applications on Google, Google infrastructure. It's highly scalable, so it scales out very well horizontally. Uh, it supports running applications in Python, so previously only 2.5, but now 2.7, Java and Go, which was recently added at Google I.O. Uh, we have a key value data store, so it's not SQL. Um, it's a lot, becoming a lot more popular these days, but back when we first launched, it was something that was a bit different. Um, we have a large collection of APIs and services that you can use, so Task Queue, which I actually work on, um, allows you to uh, defer tasks to work so that it's not in the user serving path. The channel API, which allows you to do long push to users so they get instant notifications of events, it uses the, the same infrastructure as Google Talk. Uh, XMPP, which is uh, Jabber, it allows you to have chats with users as an actual application. Email, Memcache, there are other APIs that I haven't gone into. And another really important feature is that we actually have people who hold the page at 24-7. So uh, there was actually talk about this at Google I.O., um, Life and App Engine Production. The link's there for if you want to view the YouTube video later. I recommend it. It's a really good talk. So now enough about App Engine and me in particular. What's this talk about? It's going to mainly be about asynchronous programming and how you can do asynchronous programming on App Engine. Um, and a intro quick introduction to PEP342, which is uh, a new way to do things with actually using generate functions and how you can actually use that on App Engine to make things easier to write in a procedural way um, without having to use threads. So what actually is asynchronous programming? Um, it's basically doing multiple things at the same time. Uh, in the case of App Engine, you may be fetching multiple records from data store, you may be fetching data from remote services, etc. The reason you actually want to do this is it makes things faster. I'll actually have some examples later on where I'll show you know, a sim simple example of just fetching seven websites. You can see how much faster it is to do this where you fetch all of them at the same time rather than do them synchronously. So many different ways to do asynchronous programming. Uh, we have threads. Um, as for frameworks for doing threads, we now have the new futures pep, which uh, is in Python 3.2, and I don't remember who it is, but someone's backboarded it to the older versions of Python as well, so 2.6, 2.7. Um, and generally with threads, a lot of people just prefer to roll their own sort of framework around this. Uh, you have the callback method of doing asynchronous programming, so twisted, async call, app engine user RPC, which I'm assuming most people probably haven't seen. It's not a, a very well publicized API, but it does allow you to do callback notifications on App Engine. Uh, Greenlets, which is something that doesn't run on App Engine, I'll get into that a little bit later on. And Tasklets, which is uh, what I'll actually mainly be talking about. So some of these frameworks that use that is GTasklets, which is the GTK one, and Monocle, uh, and also NDB, which I'll actually be talking about. So, wow, I broke that one good. Uh, right. Let's see if I can, if I should edit this slide live. Actually, no, I won't. Um, so with threads, um, there. Just here is a, a quick example of how you'd say fetch two different URLs with the your, uh, with the futures library. So uh, you just all you need is some kind of function that you can map uh, data into. So in this particular example, we have the executor here. We pass it to the URL fetch method, which just takes a URL, goes, grabs the data synchronously, and returns it to the user. And you go through and you just print out that data. Uh, the way that the, this particular features library works is um, you specify how many workers you want it to actually run simultaneously. In this case, I specified three. So it would mean that both of these URL fetch calls are started at the beginning of the actual loop, and then it waits and will return them the results back to you in the actual order. 
So although some of the results, the, you know, say for example, the second URL may be faster to return than the first, you'll still get them back in the correct order, but they will have executed at the same time. Unfortunately, I've lost my callback example. And actually, I've lost the rest of the slide, so I will have to edit it. Yep, I broke that pretty good. Right. Sorry about this. Yep. Shit. Um, <laughs> right, so with the callback method, um, you generally actually go about it, you uh, define the what you actually want to happen when the result, so you do the URL fetch, you define what you want to happen when the URL fetch comes back, and then you uh, have to pass that into the RPC object when you actually create it. And so what actually happens is, uh, you effectively have to define your code that deals with the return value of what you're writing uh, before you actually do the call that makes the connection to the remote web server. Um, so that was callbacks. The next one that we went on to is greenlets. Uh, greenlets is, uh, works in the way how Ruby works. It's also based on the code that was in stackless Python. Um, it's a C extension module for Python that um, maps multiple, what they call, greenlets onto a single OS thread. Um, and that actually allows you to um, get this, the same kind of code as using tasklets, etc. Um, you write synchronous program and it will uh, go through and actually execute that. Um, it won't work on AppEngine because it requires a custom C module to do. Um, and tasklets, which is actually what I wanted to get into, uh, is done using the yield statement. <sighs> yeah, that's probably a good idea, actually. I just tried that. No. Um, I've broken the HTML. Worked every other time except for now. All right, so uh, I'm not sure I bump this up. So this is a, an example of what a greenlet looks like on um, uh, using a greenlet in Python. So you import a s custom URL lib2 module, uh, which is actually has the URL, which has the greenlet functionality in. You construct a pool, and you go through and actually just uh, map over there the same way you do with the futures library. Tasklets is where things become interesting. Um, so I'm just going to, there's a, a function here, make fetch call. It's unfortunately to work around a, a bug I found in the Python asynchronous URL fetch library. So uh, yeah, I'll just kind of treat that as if it's the URL <laughs> fetch call function. Uh, so the way how you actually work with um, tasklets is you <laughs> define a uh, you use this generator, uh, sorry, this decorator function over the function, and you go through and you use yield. So you yield a call, you yield a future, and it will come back and actually call this code later on. So as you can see, this here actually does you uh, asynchronous URL fetch. Um, it goes through, it constructs multiple of these, it goes through and waits for the event loop to finish, um, and then it will print out the return code after it's actually finished. So it has the nice property that unlike callbacks, you don't have to define the code that you deal with you know, after the operation's finished before you've actually made the connection. So I'll just quickly digress into that particular bit of syntax that I showed you where you have the yield statement. So you can actually see here, uh, most people don't know that yield actually returns a value. So as of Python 2.5, uh, when they implemented this PEP, yield is no longer a statement, it's now an expression. And 
the actually has some nice properties. So it means that you can now uh, write generators that um, not just t uh, give output, they actually also take input. And so it allows you to write nice pipelines. Before this, you actually had to write them in reverse, where effectively you'd build the uh, chain of generators in reverse, where the output would go to, sorry, the input would go to the output of the previous one. Um, it's quite a horrible hack. Um, so this particular piece of code um, goes through, and it's fairly simple, takes a start, and it just goes through and decrements the number by whatever value is actually passed into the generator. Now, how does that actually work? Uh, generators now have two, sorry, have three new um, functions added to them. That is the send method, the throw method, and the close method. The send method is, uh, sorry, the next method, which already existed on them, is equivalent to send with a value of none, so that previous code continues to work. Throw does what you expect. Uh, you pass it in an exception object, the traceback, and it will actually throw at the point, it will raise that exception at the point that the yield statement previously yielded. Um, and then you also have close, which allows you to clean up a generator before it's actually finished. So you can effectively ask a generator to finish running. So I'll grab this section of code. And I will actually run it. So I have just a copy of the development console running on App Engine. And I'll actually make that greater than. And here is not a very pretty piece of code. Um, it goes through, it starts the actual generator, so you can't call send immediately on a generator. You actually have to wait one iteration for it. So you have to just call next to actually start the generator executing. Um, and then you can go through and you, uh, in this particular case, I'm going to decrement it by two every time. And you go through and you just print the output. So I will show you what that looks like. Right, so as you expect, uh, it's a very small font, but it just goes through, it prints out 8, 6, 4, and 2. So it works quite nicely. So it's sort of enough of the actual nitty-gritty implementation details of, um, of how that new PEP works. What does it actually do for us? So with, I, I'm actually going to, to use the NDB's task at library here. Um, and what it actually allows you to do is if you wrap your function with the, this tasklet, dot, tasklet uh, function, it will allow you to write a, a generator, you actually use this pep, and it will automatically prime your function. By that I mean it will call it that first next so that your code actually gets to gen, uh, actually execute some code. Um, in particular, this library is quite nice, so you've seen it before where you can just yield a single f function that returns some kind of future, and that will wait until that actually has finished and return the result for you. Um, you, can return, you can actually yield two different uh, asynchronous functions here. And what that actually allows you to do is um, wait until both of these asynchronous functions have occurred, so that if you, say, need three pieces of data from three different services, you can wait for all of them to be ready before you actually start running your code on it while you're waiting for other things to execute. And this also goes on to accept uh, a list of asynchronous functions, so if you don't know how many things you're waiting for, you can actually just generate a list of them at, at runtime and then wait for them all to finish. So. One interesting thing about having about this pep, though, is that generators can't use the return uh, statement. So how do you actually return a value from one of these uh, task lots? And at the moment, the only way to actually do that, just indent that again, the only way to actually return a value from it is to raise this special error, uh, tasklet.return. Um, Actually, in this particular case, Castle got return is stop iteration. It's just mapped to a nice name so that it actually makes sense when you're reading the code. Um, PEP 380 is about actually enhancing this generator support further. Um, it will add new syntax to allow you to yield all the contents of a generator as if you were doing it. It also adds the nice feature that this sort of horrible piece of syntax can go away and you can actually just return the length of the result 
as you would in any other normal Python code. Um, so it makes the code a lot cleaner. So this has been a very brief overview of the, the NDB library in general, but in the previous example I showed you, um, it actually went through and used event loop dot, uh, run. It's not very easy to use on App Engine when, when it's a web framework that uh, comes in and actually calls your individual requests. So how you actually go about using it on App Engine is, is something that's quite interesting. Um, this here is just a, an example of how you do a collection of URL fetches with uh, a synchronous API. Um, in this particular case, I want to go through and time how long each individual page takes to load. So we go through each URL, we grab the time at the start, make the synchronous fetch, time at the end, and just dump it into a dictionary so I can render it using the Django templating engine. So that particular code is fairly easy. And that one, I already have a copy of it running. So as you notice, it's currently loading at the moment. It takes a little bit of time to actually do. So all of them finish successfully, and uh, some of them can actually take quite a while to load. So in the case of eBay, it takes about a second. Linux Conf AU also takes about a second. So that's actually why it took so long. <laughs> if we actually look at, so we actually look at what those RPCs look like in a, a nice graph, um, we can actually see here that you know this is why it's actually taking so long. Each individual request we make, we can't start the previous one before it. Um, I'd actually suggest people who are developing on App Engine to look at this tool. This is AppStats. Um, in this particular case, it's very obvious what's happening because you saw me do the URL fetch in a loop. This here can help you debug and find performance issues in your actual code. Um, so if we go back and if we now try and do the, the same code with uh, NDB, it's actually a little bit more complicated. We have this new decorator that we're using, context.toplevel. Um, you use that to actually wrap the, the get method of the web framework that you're using. Um, in particular, I'm using web app one here just because it comes a part of App Engine. Um, I'm using the thing I was talking about before where you can just generate a, a list of all the sort of futures that you want to actually be uh, to wait on. And this here will wait for all of the fetches to actually finish. But because I actually wanted to measure the start and end time for each of the individual requests, I actually had to write a separate function up the top here where it goes through and it does the same thing that you saw before. We grab the time at the start, we create the actual fetch asynchronous RPC, and then we use yield to, to actually cause this particular bit of code to be suspended until that URL data, until the data from that fetch has actually been finished. So we go through here and we start off all seven RPCs and we, each one of these will wait until that RPC is actually completed. We can measure the time still accurately and then we still render the template as we did before. So if we look at, if we actually run this one now, you'll see that the page itself took much, was much quicker to load, and actually all of the times are roughly equivalent with the uh, you know, Linux conf AU only being you know, 0.2 of a second faster. So if we have a look at what that looks like now in this system, you can actually see that although we still spent a total of you know, 3.2 seconds waiting for RPCs in total, the final request happened in just under, over a second because the longest request that we were waiting for was also just over a second. So you can get significant performance increases with this. Um, um, and that's actually the, the two examples that I gave there. Um, while all the examples I've actually given here are specific, uh, have been URL fetch, um, NDB actually adds a nice new database extraction layer. Um, but as I will show you when I give you the links, it's considered an experimental API. Um, there are quite a few rough edges in it still, but if you're developing a new Python app engine application, I really suggest you look at this as opposed to the current DB implementation we have. Um, it's much nicer being asynchronous. It also doesn't have a lot of the pitfalls that the current APIs do. Um, and I suppose that's it, unless I have questions. Do, do we have any questions? Uh, 
I'm firing off a bunch of tasks which take too long to wait in the request. Uh, I've actually got hundreds of them. Yep. And I want to do something when all of them have completed. Uh, I can't see an API to, to tell me how many tasks I've got outstanding, for yep. one thing. <laughs> um, there's an existing bug about that at the moment. Um, there are, we are looking into write a way to approximate that, but not actually give an, an exact answer on how many tasks are. Um, if you want more about that, if you actually come and grab me afterwards, and I can go into why. I have a follow-up question. Yep. What happened on Friday? Um, <laughs> Read the downtime notification list uh, that says that all I'm allowed to say at the moment. Um, and migrate to HR. If you migrate to HR, you won't see that. Uh, HR is high the high replication data store for those of you who uh, are not very familiar with App Engine. Um, it's something we launched uh, actually probably quite a bit ago now. Um, and it is based on yeah, I'll keep talking while you're going up. Um, yep. It's based on the uh, Megastore and Paxos algorithms. Um, that's actually detailed in the white paper, and it talks about how we use uh, multiple geographically distinct places to actually protect the data. So. Yes. Hi. Uh, my question's, uh, uh, does, this, um, does this help you in terms of um, maybe writes to the data store, um, overcoming like um, a problem of if you're doing too many writes, you get contention or you... Um uh, no, the particular issue with um, contention with data store writes is not actually in your application code. It's actually down at the data store layer. Um, if you have a look at that Paxos white paper, it explains why that is the case. Okay, so even just, for example, fanning out several writes in different sessions isn't going to necessarily overcome an issue of load? Uh, yeah, so the, the actual thing that you want to do to overcome this is not actually fan out, you want to fan in your writes. So oh, right, you want yeah, so one commit for multiple, yeah. Yeah, you want to try and, uh, you know, the, this is actually a fairly good example for pull queues, which I'll kind of give a plug for. Um, you know, you can write uh, 10 different bits of information there that you want to update in data store and then you can go through and you have some asynchronous process that grabs these 10 records, merges them in you know, whatever application logic it means and then do a single write rather than 10 writes. I see. Right, thank you. Okay, uh, any other questions? No? Um, if people are interested in this or App Engine things in particular, uh, App Engine things in general, um, feel free to see me sort of for the rest of the conference. And my email is all the way at the start of the slide where they actually work. All right. Well, thank you very much, Greg.